Welcome to the Badlands, that overlooked place where philosophical thought runs into the political concerns of the day. Welcome to the Badlands Politics and Philosophy Podcast Roundtable Discussion where we get the opportunity to have a more informal discussion about some issue that's in the news or on our minds. I'm Toby Napolitano, and with me are my fellow Badlands contributors, Michael Hughes. Hello, Toby. Hello, Michael. Hannah Gunn. Hi. And Jared Henderson. Hi there. You guys are laughing at me already. Yeah. Brutal. Rough crowd. <laughs> I, I, was laugh I was laughing at Michael. Let me be very clear. <laughs> All right, that's acceptable. I'll take that. So, you know, we philosophers, we get a bad rap for, you know, what, being useless? Is that the, the general charge? I think, <laughs> we don't, uh, we yeah, don't do yeah. anything of value. You're about to say we're useful? <laughs> no, I, I'd say we're either useless or possibly harmful. Mm. Uh, that's, that's a tough case to make the harmful yeah. case. Anyways, so while that might be largely justified, I, I think there's one thing we're, we're fairly good at. We're good bullshit detectors, Right. If, uh, if there's any, if there's one class of people in society that gets especially pissed off by bullshit, shitty slogans, or bad pieces of received wisdom, I think it's philosophers. Yeah, that that one sounds fair. Yeah. Hannah, Hannah says no. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. There's also a lot of. I mean, depends what you want to call bullshit. <laughs> okay, well, I think I'm a good bullshit detector. <laughs> I, I would say the the real critique here is we probably produce as much bullshit as we detect. Oh, that's that's one hundred percent correct. I suppose half the game though is calling out other philosophers for writing bullshit. Exactly. If it's bullshit. not our own bullshit, so, you know. Yeah, as long as it's not our own bullshit, <laughs> that's yeah. right. We can produce bullshit, and it's fine to produce bullshit as long as you mm. can call it out as bullshit, and distinguish it from the stuff that's not bullshit. It's and probably, see, that's a philosophical contribution right there. <laughs> so, anyways, the topic for today is uh, a particular strain of bullshit that. Honestly, pissed me off en enough one night, just out of the blue. I woke up at like 3 a.m. And I was just pissed off at this piece of bullshit. <laughs> and I started writing this piece that's up on the Badlands about the idea of coming together. Right? So, so the name of the piece I wrote is called The Cure for Toxic Partisanship is Not Coming Together. All right. So th this is a phrase as, as progressives we're very familiar with, right? Uh, even just on the left, right, there's this idea that like, you, you damn progressives, you got to come together with the rest of the Democratic Party, and if you don't, you're jerks. Mm -hmm. That's, that seems familiar. All right. We're all familiar with this. Yeah. Okay. So, but you also hear in, in a sort of broader setting, just talking about the um, state of political discourse in the United States in general. Um, so there's this idea, right, like, so first of all, right, there's this idea that our politics is, are hugely divided. It's toxic. Liberals and, and conservatives are pitted in this just like eternal useless struggle <laughs> where nothing gets done etc there's no agreement and what we have to do to overcome this is come together right we got uh, i don't know what that means right this is part of the problem and, and you can tell i'm already getting mad so someone else just pick up on this thread i'm too angry i need to take a break for a second <laughs> <laughs> well so i think um you said you don't know what it means to to come together uh, and I figure there's got to be at least what three or four different meanings that people could, ha uh, or yeah, there, there's three many. or four different senses that people could mean by it. Yeah, and I think I'm okay with some of them where I'm not okay with others. Um, yeah. So, yeah. So there's there's this really thin sense of coming together where it just means we should talk. Um, and if you're someone who thinks that, <laughs> and if you're someone who thinks that like <laughs> deliberation is good for democracy, <laughs> coming together is great. Um. The next time you get into a spat with your spouse, yep. right? The mm -hmm. text message. I think we need to come together. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, that's always that, very that effective. Good. Yeah. People love that that yeah. political talk. It's but great. I mean, if you think if you think deliberation is important, and if by coming together you just mean let's get together to deliberate, yeah. Now, I'm not the one yeah. here who could talk about why deliberation is important, but uh, if you did. So, so let me maybe just clarify, uh, let me try to illustrate a little bit more of the senses of coming together that pissed me off enough to keep mm -hmm. me up that one night. <laughs> um, so, for instance, after really close uh, elections, presidential elections, for instance, 
there's this idea that so one of the main jobs of, of the new president is to heal the divides, mm -hmm. right? There's been this we've gone through this horrible experience together known as a U.S. presidential election. And now we hate each other. So we need to heal the divides. And, and we do that by coming together, right? This is like something that we're supposed to do, which is an interesting kind of idea, right? So the, the thing that I find objectionable is often it seems like the suggestions to come together are suggestions that we stop disagreeing, right? It's like we have different ideas about how the country should be, but stop it and just come together, right? And that seems like a, at, at minimum, really kind of anti-intellectual or at least a sort of paternalistic kind of idea. It's like, well, so I think, I mean, okay, that raises the question of who's meant to do the coming together. And this comes back to Jared's point as well, right? So you're meant to come together. Um, what you just said there is that, you know, your average citizens, like they're all meant to come together. They're the ones where the disagreements occur and they're the ones who have the problems such that they should like come together, get along and talk to one another. Um, but we might not mean that uh, at all, right? Perhaps the people who need to come together and engage in better deliberation are the politicians themselves. Um, so sometimes, you know, the coming together is applied to, you know, what do you call them? The peasants. Um, <laughs> but at other times it's used uh, in that same sort of a way, right? Come together, stop disagreeing, but it's not applied to, you know, your average person, it's applied to politicians. Yeah. And those are completely different uses, mm -hmm. right? Um, and it suggests a completely different kind of problem that exists. And so a completely different kind of solution that needs to take place. And and also, uh, you said that it, you reading it, you read it as um, coming together means stop disagreeing. And the important question there is, what are, what are we disagreeing about, or what should we stop disagreeing about? So if it means let's set aside our unimportant disagreements that we've let uh, take center stage, so we can focus on more important things that we do agree on, um, that's one sense. And another one is like set aside really substantive important disagreements for the sake of decorum or, or yeah <laughs> for norms patriotism yeah yeah all being americans or something yeah. for the sake yeah. of unity or something like this as if coming together yeah. right uh, pretending to agree is itself a virtue yeah it's almost like we're this uh, sort of sports team it's like you know what we we have disagreements with each other but for the sake of this game we gotta you know we gotta put that aside so we can, you know, have sufficient unity to go out there and, and be, I don't, I don't know where this is going. And I mean, and I think this is one of the things why it's easier for sort of um, uh, centrist Democrats to say we should come together when they're talking to progressives is because as like the theme of uh, earlier episodes has been, um, they don't view their, they don't view uh, the differences between progressives and centrist Democrats as substantive. So they seem like the kinds of things we could, we could set aside. But from the perspective of like a progressive, they are real disagreements and they're harder to set aside. So, so I really wonder how we're supposed to understand this in, in the context of like uh, actual bitter partisan divides between Republicans and Democrats. Like I have no idea what we actually mean when we try to apply the same idea of like, let's set aside our differences when it comes to most of the bitter divides between Republicans and Democrats. Does anybody have any way of interpreting that? Can you give us some, um, which, which sort of bitter divides are you thinking of? Think of the government shutdown, right? There's this talk that the parties need to come together. And in some sense, that seems reasonable, given that um, the government can't function at all, right? <laughs> like, it, that seems like uh, an important time for us to come together and get something done, because if we don't, all yeah. of our critical social services are effectively shut down. Um but at the same time, when we talk about coming together, what does that mean in the current, you know, in, in this context? Like, should should Democrats and Republicans basically just say, all right, we're not going to actually address any of the really divisive issues that are currently blocking any kind of agreement? Should they just set aside all of those critical things? Um, or is there some other way that they that we actually mean that they should come together? Yeah, it makes it sound like um, the disagreements or something between, say, the Dreamers controversy, right? Should these um, uh, immigrants be allowed to stay or forced to leave or whatever? Um, that there's actually an easy answer here <laughs> to the question. Uh, and the only reason that there's a dispute is because people are refusing to accept 
the obvious answer or something, right? Like there already is a solution we could all accept, uh, but we're so determined to remain on opposite teams that we refuse to come to the obvious solution. And that's not at all clear that that's the, you know, the, the situation at all, right? You just have two different sides that disagree. Um, so there isn't an obvious solution that they can come together on that's going to make everybody happy, right? So people are just being unreasonably entrenched uh, where there is a solution that we could take that would have the practical, you know, would let us achieve the practical outcomes that we want or something. Um, I mean, the cynical uh, read on this is that uh, Democrats and Republicans can come together all the time, but it's always on things like astronomically high military spending. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Which is almost never challenged. Yeah. And surveillance. Um, surveillance is something surveil- we're yeah, all pretty yeah, willing to yeah. agree on. But again, politicians are all pretty willing to agree on. Uh, so, yeah. you know, we've jumped into assuming now that the coming together is something that they have to do, not that citizens have to do. Um, yeah. And it's interesting because, you know, this phrase is used by politicians to the general public. They don't use it between mm-hmm. one another, right? Apart from that, you know, the Democratic Party case where they are saying to, you know, say the Bernie Sanders contingent of the Democratic Party, you should come together with the rest of the party, right? There is some of that politician to politician um, calling for coming together. But usually it's, you know, people like Hillary Clinton or something saying to the general public, we all need to come together, <laughs> so I guess I, I, I yeah, and I think so. We've slipped into talking about it in terms of just politicians yeah. because it's very easy for us to imagine it because you know there's what, what s- roughly 600 that we can have in mind uh, in DC that they can uh, come together in rooms and deliberate. But what does it look? We, we we know we know what it means for them to come together. It's like to pass a bill or something. I I actually don't know what it means for us as. Um, sort of political opponents in the citizenry to come together. And that's where, you know, if it's pundits or politicians talking to citizens, it starts sounding really undemocratic, right? It starts sounding like, just put aside your disagreements, right? Just stop, stop engaging in the political process. It's annoying. Yeah. Um, But in the case between politicians uh, to politicians, that does happen. Sometimes you'll hear it say, you know, Democrats and Republicans need to come together on the issue of health care. That's kind of interesting, right? And so, so one thing that's often meant is um, what we need is bipartisan compromise, not nonpartisanship, mm-hmm. bipartisanship. And this is an interesting uh, thing because it sounds really nice, right? It sounds like this is, of course, this is what we want. It's you know, you get the picture of politicians sometimes. If we complain that you know people can't come together, it's just they're just being stubborn, right? Just stop being so stubborn. Yeah. Have a compromise. This is how these things work. The problem is, of course, um, you know, if you're a progressive, the idea of bipartisan compromise sounds catastrophic because of what those compromises would actually be. So, for instance, if we're talking about health care or tax reform, if Democrats and Republicans compromise on that, you get some position that neither the Republicans nor Democrats will hate completely. So somewhere between mm-hmm. the Republican position and the Democrat Democratic position, yeah. which to a progressive sounds horrible, <laughs> right? That sounds like, yeah, oh, I mean, God, we're screwed. <laughs> like, I mean, frankly, I don't give a shit if it's like 40 Republicans and 20 Democrats voted on a bill. Uh, I care if whether or not health care is actually being given to people who need it. <laughs> um, that's that's the important part. The fact that a few uh, that people from different parties were able to agree on it doesn't really matter to me um, all that much. That way of interpreting it is something like um, bipartisanship is good when you have, you know, a bunch of representatives from one dominant political party and another political party all sort of agreeing on something. Um, Another way, though, is to take that metaphor a little bit more seriously. So instead of thinking about the number of people from each party that support it, you have like the left side of the spectrum and the right side of the spectrum. And so the people on the left propose this and the people on the right propose that. Um, Problem is progressives are like, far, far off to the left. So anything between your centrist left position and your centrist right position, for instance, um, is going to be somewhere in the middle of those two. And so if you're really far off to the left, anything in that middle ground between them is not the kind of solution that you're going to think is a permissible one. And I don't, I mean, that kind of scale doesn't work for all problems. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, that really thinking about various, a lot of political compromise is like a pick and mix basket of well, you can have this bit of this policy, but we want this bit of this policy, right? So it's not really a scale kind of thing. But, um, you know, that's a massive problem. I mean, so so one one sort of major 
um, complication here that we've already uh, raised is that there's really a difference between sort of public opinion and representative opinion, right? And we have often when we talk about coming together, we are talking about either representative representatives coming together to literally achieve some policy goal or the public come together to have a more coherent and sort of fruitful public discussion over policy. But the the other issue is, or along those same lines, there is a question of when we talk about center right, center left positions, right, there are similarly disparate scales when it, when it comes to sort of what the uh, left right and center look like when we're talking about representative opinion versus when we're talking about public opinion, right? And there's lots of Pew research that suggests that um, for a lot of issues, there's actually um, quite a bit of agreement um, by the public for or over issues of public spending, like massive infrastructure spending, right? I think, I suspect if you look at the Pew research, the general public is typically in favor of infrastructure spending. Um, typically bills for infrastructure spending pass, right? It's pretty rare that they don't. Similarly, when it comes to things like corporate tax rates, there's massive agreement that the corporate tax rates are too low, that corporations don't pay their fair share. Something like 80% of the public thinks that. Nevertheless, we just got a bill passed, right? To substantially lower corporate tax rates. So it does seem like there's a very big divide between where the left, center, and right are when it comes to public opinion versus when it comes to representative opinion. Um, and when it comes to the convergence to the middle, um, progressives might actually be pretty happy if we were to converge to the public middle, but we'd be very unhappy if we converge to the representative middle. Yeah, which mm -hmm. is, is something that makes us especially grumpy, right? Because typically the right, left framing and these policy discussions and bipartisan compromise are framed within the the spectrum that is defined by the news media and the politicians, which massively de departs <laughs> from public opinion. Another case will be like campaign finance. Everyone thinks it's broken, right? <laughs> there, are, there are no bills uh, currently <laughs> being passed to fix that, right? Okay, but let's go back to this um, compromise issue, because I, I end up raising a kind of controversial claim in the paper and, and just now, and I'm, I'm in effect saying I'm against bipartisan compromise right now. And that, at least on the surface, just sounds like it runs against our you know deep ideas about what democracy should be like. So you, you say that bipartisan compromise isn't uh, necessarily a good thing. But the obvious place to start is ask, well what would make it a good thing? Like, how do we justify or argue for bi uh, bipartisan compromise generally? Why do people think that bi bipartisan compromise uh, is something that we should want? In general, you know, and then I guess more generally, how do we uh, evaluate our policy decision processes more generally? Yeah, I think probably the um, uh, desire for bipartisan compromise comes more broadly from... The idea that uh, public political de deliberation is a good thing. Um, and in democracies, this is a central value that we have, right? What you want is the citizens to be reasonably informed so that they can all talk with one another about their political disagreements, um, how they think society should be set up, right? What their beliefs are about these particular issues. Um, and then, you know, elect representatives that have views that are amenable to their views. And then the politicians can come together and vote on those things. So, you want a lot of deliberation and discussion and conversation in a democracy so that more views get heard um, and the policy decisions that you uh, end up with are ones that actually represent what people want. Now, why do we think that uh, people talking to one another is going to help this process at all? Um, well, the common idea, I take it, is that people deliberating with one another about really complicated issues is a way to get to the truth. Right, so the more options that we have on the table and the more people who can 
I'm just going to use the phrase come together <laughs> to deliberate about it, um, the more likely we are to get at the best solution, right? The best answer, the, the true answer to whatever the problem is. Um, we may not need truth there. We might just need like most effective or most practical. Um, but there is a thought there that, you know, one of the reasons why democracies are so good is because they give us this space for public deliberation around these issues that really matter. And when we engage in public deliberation, we're more likely to get to the truth or to the best solutions. Um, and I take it bipartisan compromise is an extension of this, right? You've got, broadly speaking, in the States at least, two major ideological political groups. Um, and so the thought is, if they come together and deliberate across this divide, right, representing the values of their respective bases, then they're more likely to get to the truth. Hmm. Um, and one of the problems that we've pointed out already is, well, if you're somebody who's very far to the left or very far to the right of either of these two centrist parties, you're beliefs aren't on the table. So the things that are going to be picked from um, aren't going to include right, your beliefs on various policy decisions. So anything you believe doesn't get sort of added to the equation, right? isn't factored in as something that might help you get to the truth. So it's you know exclusionary, and that's one of the reasons why. It's a different reason for why that kind of thinking about it in the spectrum way um, is not, I don't know, optimistic or something for people who don't fall into those centrist camps. Right. And one of the things that makes it so frustrating is that the, often you feel like the beliefs that you have are excluded from the public discussion, not based on sort of the evidential merits against your ideas or beliefs, but rather due to other kinds of, because of the nature of the political game itself, right? That Money. it's not really the political, <laughs> the political discourse. Let's just say it. <laughs> Isn't trying to get at the truth, right? It's right. Yeah. ultimately trying to win these contests over who can be in charge, right? And so that's one of the obvious reasons for cynicism. I actually, I want to tie that back earlier. Um, so one of the reasons why I personally pay so much attention to who's saying we need to come together and who that's meant to be targeted at um, is because of the the sort of propaganda and the rhetoric of control um, that these kinds of slogans uh, have for people. So if, you know, it's, it's very um, helpful for you as somebody in a position of power to say things like, we all need to come together and make that everybody else's problem while you're sort of subtly rigging the game so that you're always going to keep winning. So it's a diversionary tactic, right? We have, we promote this idea that deliberation and coming together is good because it helps us get to the truth whilst making sure that the things that get into the deliberation are the things that are going to keep us in power or get us the results that we want. So we keep everybody focused on this like big, grand, philosophical, epistemic goal, if you like, right, about getting to the truth and bipartisan deliberation is going to do this and look at us engaging in bipartisan deliberation. And let's just really quickly cover up the fact that we're not actually letting a lot of people into the into into that deliberation um and it's not genuine at all but we can use these slogans to keep people focused on that sort of abstract goal at the end that we're pretending to work towards um so it's bullshit like i said yeah it's, you know <laughs> <laughs> but that you know it's it's um you know those sorts of slides about you know what are the political virtues that we're all and values right that we're promoting and that slogans are trying to get at and how are those being used to sort of keep everybody's focus away from what's actually happening? <laughs> so, so that anticipates the problem for another angle I was going to suggest we consider for uh, in defense of or angle for defending bipartisan compromise. So another uh, common approach to trying to defend the importance of bipartisan, bipartisan compromise is to um, sort of note that on the one hand, we want to get at the truth of what policies are actually going to make people's lives better. But on the other hand, we also want a government that just, in some sense, respects the collective will of the people, right? And we think that legitimate government uh, ultimately requires or involves uh, the government in some ways aggregating and responding to the collective will of the people, right? And that bipartisan compromise is a way that our representatives can come together and reach um, political decisions, which are at least close to the sort of aggregate or average position of the American people, right? But as you've noted, that's not really part of 
the the goal either, right? It's really still just a political game to try to uh, protect one's own institutional authority more than anything else. And if that's the case, then that defense is hard to hard to buy. Yeah, I mean, should we spell out that distinction, right, yeah. between legitimacy and justification? So, you know, a policy could be justified um, because it's based on the best evidence that we have, right? So we're going to say, look, this healthcare plan will give the most people the best coverage possible. Here's all the evidence that supports that. And so, you know, a policy could be justified because that's, you know, that's the basis um, for accepting the policy. And we think uh, in many cases that this kind of bipartisan intergroup deliberation is going to help us get at the best evidence, right? Because everybody's got their own evidence. We look at it all together, right? We don't ignore some evidence um, that we otherwise may not have seen for any reasons of bias or something like that, right? Um, so we're going to get the best justified policies through uh, each group's bringing the evidence to bear on the problem. Um, legitimacy is different, right? A policy can be legitimate just because it has been voted on. Right. So you can have um, a political party or a policy or anything. Right. The members of that party are legitimate members because the voting procedures will follow correctly. Right. A policy is legitimate because it's voted on by the right, uh, you know, members uh, according to the rules that have been laid down in the Constitution or something like this. That makes it legitimate. And justification doesn't have to come into that legitimacy um, procedure at all. Yeah. Right. Um, it can purely be justification. Uh, sorry. Purely just be legitimization. Yeah. Uh, following the rules of the game. Yeah. yeah. And, and often people will argue for, for the goodness of democracies on both grounds, right? On the one hand, you get this kind of crowdsourcing deliberation effect where we hope that we get better outcomes. Um, and, you know, there's also uh, the idea that the people know what's best for them and really policy is about what's good for them. So, you know, they'll be in a good position to judge what good policies are. But then also, of course, there's this deep philosophical question about what it takes for a government to be legitimate. Why is it legitimate for a government to subject you to its laws, potential violence, imprisonment, and things like that for doing various things? And democracy is meant to be good because, in some sense, it's more plausible that people kind of consent to that, right, through the democratic practices. But as, as we're noting here, these, <laughs> these goals of, of legitimacy and justification or good political outcomes come into conflict sometimes. Right. In easy cases, if you just have a really uninformed or misinformed citizenry, they might decide on policies that are disastrous for them. That should sound pretty familiar. And so this is part of my pessimism about bipartisan compromise. Whether you're talking about the politicians, as we know, that's going to be disastrous. Um, and so the, the, the citizens themselves, you know, will argue have more progressive views. But if you were to just take a Republican ideologue and a Democratic ideologue and have them sort of deliberate with one another, why think that the outcome will be particularly good? I see, I mean, both camps seem pretty misinformed. Seems like they'll just get more misinformation out of that. I think it's intuitive because of the ways that everybody's talking about um, political polarization at the moment and belief polarization at the moment. Justification is the side that we tend to think about. Right. So we tend to think look, justification is what we need. We need more informed people. We need better evidence. Da, 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 da. But you can there's perfectly good reasons to want legitimacy over justification. Right. Um, the best evidence for what gets, you know, maybe the fastest method to get rid of a particular kind of kind of crime is to imprison some massive population of people with a really low degree of evidence. Right. That could get rid of crime. But. Maybe you don't want what the most effective means is going to be for some end, right? Um, legitimacy can require other things, right? You're more likely to get, no, you ca just can't, you know, as a matter of legitimacy for laws, they must treat all citizens equally or something like this. And that's not always going to be the most effective thing at the end of the day. Um, I don't know. I just think it's important for us to say something about why legitimacy could ever trump justification, because I think most people, especially given the way that we're talking about these things, why would legitimacy ever be a good thing? Take, you know, the presidential election, right? Popular opinion didn't get it, didn't get the president elected. The process got the president elected and made legitimate. So, you know, for a lot of people, it's the legitimacy stuff is kind of not sensible right now. But at the same, right. But at the same time, we have to decide, right. Uh, we have to have some means of sort of collectively deciding what the just, what the 
justification or the evidence actually supports, right? Like we as progressives feel like currently um, our, uh, the current government's justifications are completely invalid. And we, in some sense, are not appreciative of the democratic ideals um, in part because they don't seem to actually uh, produce good outcomes, right? That's, that's generally our feeling, but at the same time, we could, uh, you know, find our representatives to be in power at some point in the future. And people on the other side of the political spectrum are going to feel the same way about our policies, right? And, and a big part of insisting on the importance of our democratic ideals uh, and the legitimacy of our government is to protect against either side basically saying, fuck it, um, I'm not going to respect our government. And you can go ahead and bleep that, Toby. Nah, that was uh, a good one. <laughs> Uh, I'm not going to respect the authority of our government and I'm going to do what I want, right? And so for the overall efficacy of our government or for the ability of our government to function at all, there has to be some respect for um, the institutional authority of our government. And, and without respecting legitimacy as an important part of that, it's hard to see how we get sort of collective buy-in from everybody to continue to respect that authority. I think there are complaints from progressives at the moment against coming together for justification reasons and for legitimacy reasons, right? So we've gone over a number of the justification reasons, namely that progressive opinions don't get into the deliberative process, right? So our evidence and arguments aren't, be being, aren't being taken seriously. Instead, they're being pushed to the side. There's no real dispute between progressives and centrist Democrats, da 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 da, da right? That whole line. Um, but the legitimacy concern is that you can't get people who don't hold the centrist positions into the positions of power so that they can be engaged in those kinds of political deliberations. Um, so that's a completely, you know, that's a very different complaint. Um, so you mean you've, the progressive Progressives, positions? Yeah. sorry, yeah. So you've rigged the system so that the people who end up getting to be the representatives, the ones who get to do the policy deliberations, are only from a very select group. And I think... Most and they people, don't represent popular opinion. Yeah, <laughs> and, so, and that's part of the reason why they're not legitimate, because one of these ideals is that, you know, in a democracy, this is meant to be good because you have a whole bunch of different people living together, and they have a whole bunch of different moral, you know, political views um, about you know, economic views about how society should be and how things should go. And then you have a representative system that gets a lot of those different views to sort of be forced to work together so that more people can be happy. So you don't have to demand that everybody is one homogenous whole. Um, and I think we have serious doubts that mm -hmm. that process of getting legitimate leaders in um, is taking place. The, the other thing to mention here uh, is that legitimacy typically, particularly when it comes sort of, when we think of democratic the democratic ideal, it's not just sort of majoritarian rule where we reflect the, where the government's decisions reflect the sort of collective will, but also that it respects sort of basic human rights. And the other sort of really big complaint today, right, is that our government seems to be going in a direction that is less respectful of sort of individual rights and basic sort of human rights um, that are supposed to be protected under the sort of democratic ideal so there's sort of there are multiple reasons why progressives might feel like our current uh sort of uh, coming together or coming to the middle might not respect or or reflect um a sort of legitimate governmental decision process yeah so it's it's tough i, I think that's absolutely right progressives we have criticisms concerning both legitimacy and justification and, and political outcome the the policies that are often on the table right now seem so bad given our current state that I mean I mean the reason why the the claim seems controversial my claim that uh, you know bipartisan compromise right now on these issues I think is bad um, even if we were to grant that those kinds of compromises would be the most legitimate way to go because the the consequences of the policies we're considering are so disastrous and, and again it's it's implausible that we say that you know how the current process is a legitimate one, but even if it were, unfortunately, it seems like we, we'd almost we'd have to set aside those deep democratic ideals to avoid the worst outcomes that <laughs> would be on the table. Okay, so, so here's something that I think makes this question of legitimacy even more complicated. 
And that is, so we know, right, we're talking about sort of the political beliefs of the people and their policy positions and so on. But this is really tough because, right, there's this really commonplace phenomenon that people point out and that um, people vote against their own interests. And sometimes, you know, it's not true. Sometimes they are. But in some cases, they plausibly are, right? And why is that? <laughs> well, a uh, pretty straightforward explanation is that a lot of people's and let's be honest, a lot of people's political beliefs are not very deep, not very well thought out. Um, they've accepted really simplistic narratives that one gets by listening to you know, the mainstream news outlets occasionally. And so there's this, this deep legitimacy problem where you, know, you might be able to take a survey of people's opinions on some position – but the explanation for why they have them is not because, you know, they've thought about it and uh, aligns with their values really well, but just because they were sort of socialized conditions, socialized. I mean, yeah, it's a, I want a word that wasn't like, you know, so cynical, but sure. Right. I mean, this, is, this is the idea that of, of manufacturing consent. Right? I mean, that, yeah, socialized um, is just a normal yeah. part of growing up and developing. We're all we've all been socialized <laughs> to yeah. serve for corporate overlords. And you're just you know, you're... <laughs> effectively. Yeah. <laughs> All right, but so there's there's in effect propaganda that's very effective that frames the acceptable political narrative such that the acceptable range of positions go from centrist democrat to centrist democrat republican <laughs> uh well I was like does, does it go as far as to, I mean what what even how do you even describe the you know the far end of the republican party and that's it so so it's difficult because it's not as though people mm -hmm. get the information that they need to form to to come to informed political positions where you might think um you might think legitimacy requires that right if they don't get the opportunity to even do that what are you even doing when if you're reflecting the the median position it's sort of an artificial median that's been created right a lot of people don't want that right a lot of people don't want to spend a lot of time thinking through uh political problems and becoming informed and finding out the relevant evidence that they need um, to have, you know, the best, I don't know, most well-rounded, critically considered uh, opinion on a lot of topics. For a lot of people, that's just not what they want. Um, so you get this trust problem. Um, one of the things that's meant to be so appealing about representative democracies, right, is that the average citizen doesn't have to do all of that legwork to become really informed about everything that they have political beliefs about. Uh, you know, ideally what we do is we look at the political parties, we understand the spectrum, um, we pick those representatives that we take to be trustworthy and credible and have the same kinds of political, economic, moral leanings as we do, and we just trust them to represent us in ways that are good for us. Um, this is where that justification legitimacy problem really starts to intersect and why this issue of propaganda is so problematic. Um, because if you're putting your trust in people who are intentionally limiting or you know, changing the uh, the scope of the conversation or something, right? Um, deliberately misleading people. Um, I mean, that's that's a problem. Right. So, so the idea is, you know, there, there's a concern if, if people are the people you're trusting are deliberately misleading you or trying to uh, inculcate certain views in you. But they need not even be doing that, right? One of the things that um, when we were talking about money and politics, that we, we pointed out is that that can happen unintentionally. Right. Because uh, the way the current system is, um, it favors people who have money and views that are favorable to people who have money. They will take positions of power and they will frame the political discussion around their own political worldview and one which will be friendly to their interests. Right. As opposed to and friend, else. friendly to their interests and in also just informed by their experience. Right. Yeah. And, and the fact is, is that. The people who typically are represented on the media are highly educated, um, and those people typically come from particular socioeconomic backgrounds and have very distinctive world experiences from the, the probably the average American citizen. Um, and so, sort of organically, through natural selection effect biases, you get people, uh, you get discussions that aren't really reflective of the average person's experience in America.
Okay, so one of the things that's that I wanted to talk to you guys about that's in the background of all these claims that we need, well, not all of them, but a lot of the claims that we need to come together is this idea that, you know, the, the state of American politics right now is disastrous, right? People are massively di divided and polarized, and we can't have productive political discussions with each other because everyone's so staunchly conservative or, or liberal, and so... Um, you know, the, the state of discourse is just broken. So I guess a couple questions we have are just, one, do you agree with that? Uh, two, is it a problem? And, and how does this relate to some of the other things that we've been talking about? I'll be a real philosopher about it. Oh, oh shit. <laughs> I don't know and I don't know because we need, I don't know, I feel like we have to be a bit more specific. Um, <laughs> I just got philosophered. Uh, so she detected your bullshit. And <laughs> she <just> did. <laughs> she sussed it out real quick. Is discourse broken? Well, I don't know. Who's discourse? Have we ever been really good at talking across the divide? Um, well, we need to know if there's always been a divide. Um, what the nature the of the divide, <laughs> <laughs> right? Uh, you know, one of the things that's, you know, we don't talk about this right now, but, um, we can, that's picked out as being significant right now is that part of the reason there's a, Divide is not for political reasons per se, but for identity reasons. Um, that's a completely different divide than disagreeing about particular political po policies. Right. Um, what was your second question? Is it a problem? Is it a problem? Well, I don't know. It, it like, is it a problem that your average person doesn't talk to people from the other side of the political spectrum than them? Well, it's a problem if we think that the conversations of average citizens actually impact the political process at all. And it's not clear for a lot of cases that they do, as you know, you guys bring up in the Money and Politics episode, for instance, your average person's political beliefs don't translate into policy positions. So the state of public discourse may or may not have, you know, great consequences for policy decisions. Uh, so in what ways do we think that it does, right? Um, if all of us start talking to each other really nicely on the weekend at the coffee shop, uh, is this going to change? Now you sound like me in my paper. Well, <laughs> <laughs> that's the assumption, right? Um, well, that's what the politicians seem to be telling us. Come together, yeah. talk to people in the supermarket line who you might disagree with, <laughs> assuming that your supermarket is one which caters to people from different political leanings, which it may not be. Um, well, so I guess, I mean, we can start first with, do you guys agree that um, the current state of politics and political discourse is toxic and highly partisan. They kind of go hand in hand. They're not, they're not the same thing, obviously. But I mean, what do you think about that? So, so, so I, I think that it's toxic. Um, I'd say, yes, it is toxic. To me, the big problem is that the political discourse that we have, it's not that we're polarized, but that the discourse itself is literally pointless, right? <laughs> that we quite literally don't try to get at the truth, right? If you listen to CNN, Fox News, if you listen to the radio, what you're mostly going to get is a big pile of ad hominems uh, and fundamental attribution errors um, and just people basically trying to caricature, caricature the other side as um, badly as they possibly can, right? And to a large extent, the discourse that we have just doesn't seem like it's aimed at reaching a point of mutual understanding or learning from each other. Um, so in those respects, it does seem toxic to me. I mean, that's largely the discussion around political discourse uh, online and on social media as well. Um, people aren't engaging in it as a process of political inquiry and deliberation. Um, a lot of it seems more to do with just limbasting the other side, trying to make the other people sound crazy, um, undermine the credibility of them as speakers um, and of their views through just, you know, turning them into little catchy phrases that make them sound stupid. I mean, I, I think I would agree um, that the discourse is definitely partisan. Um, perhaps it's toxic because people are expressing their anger or something but um whether or not that translates to the discourse somehow being broken i'm really not sure uh i mean michael saying you know it's all pointless yeah perhaps um but i don't think for instance having combative political discussions 
especially at like a at the level of representatives is a bad thing um i yeah. don't or at least i don't see that as immediately bad uh, especially when we have uh radically different values <laughs> we value very different things and um if we paper over that by being sort of too nice or too friendly when we talk to each other that does more harm than good uh perhaps conjecture yeah. there but yeah. um i can't prove that but because it, it downplays the significance of our disagreement right so, so i want to just i want to just be clear I, I i don't think it's pointless because it's not sufficiently nice mm-hmm. right and i don't generally think niceness is even a virtue uh <laughs> this but, explains so much yeah yes. no that's why i'm such an asshole uh <laughs> but but i do think that it, it's pointless insofar as people really aren't actually sort of engaging in sort in good faith to try to understand each other right uh and i think the sort of the, there are actually really healthy combative discussions that happen at in uh congress i mean there was there was recent exchanges over um the uh corporate tax rate stuff that seemed like it was very visceral and mm-hmm. should be right yeah. But there, it seemed like people were really trying to drill down on this, the reasons why they were favoring various policies. But I think often in, when you think about media discourse, like if you look at CNN, there is not actually that much discussion of policies and justifications for policies. Mm-hmm. It's largely about the political game, right? There was that oh, study. Yeah. I mean, you hear it. Uh political commentary on something like CNN, the amount of times that the discussion is about the optics of a policy oh, or God. the optics of a move exactly. rather optics. than... Can we do the, an episode on optics? <laughs> we should absolutely do an episode on optics because it's turned political commentary. <laughs> Being into politics is more about... Um, marketing. <laughs> uh, projecting, yeah, like what the marketing impact of something is going to be or how it's going to play rather so, than so, the, what the ver- like issues of the policy are. Yeah. So the, on the, that, the analogy, totally agree. The, the, the analogy that always strikes me as right is like, CNN has become kind of like ESPN right before a game of like yep. just blather about who's going to win rather than and even oh man the like the presidential debates these days the intros for them it's like it's like the the video intro you'd expect for a boxing match mm-hmm. it's ridiculous <laughs> and then Bernie the, 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 Sanders <laughs> the socialist Hillary Clinton. <laughs> Oh, and like what was it? The like, centrist. When, when, everyone, when everyone thought that Biden might jump in, there was like an empty podium, and they kept cutting to it uh, before one of the debates because he might just decide to run. Um, it's like a WWE I mean, it was, match. It was like watching like LeBron's decision. <laughs> <laughs> um, and but then the like sort of the post debate analysis is always, um, ooh, how is this going to play? Oh, he was really speaking to these people or something. And like I thought this. the rather the than posture saying, like, of yeah. Martin O'Malley was just impeccable. He yeah. really projected power and leadership. Yeah, it, it's this kind of analysis that I think is that I think is horrendous. But to not go too far into stray about, we, I mean, we should talk about optics sometime. I think that is absolutely right. <laughs> optics are bullshit, and we should um, we should talk it's about other people talking about optics. Yeah. We shouldn't talk about optics. Right. Um, but um, I want I I kind of want my representatives to be um, to be fierce to. Uh, not just because it looks good. I want them to like to really fight hard for policies and not just to uh, shake hands with the people that they radically disagree with just for the sake of like being all right. People talk about, you know, the Senate used to have an ice cream social every week where they all wore seersucker, which is like the most old white man thing possible. <laughs> uh, and everyone's like, well, we don't do that anymore. And that's one of the problems. Like, that's fuck what's no, wrong one, of the, with one of the problems is that you want to give all my money to the rich people. <laughs> <laughs> so, Okay. So, all right. So that's a, an interesting discussion of, of partisanship and, and perhaps toxicity among the representatives. But I think often people are talking about like, like so. So this seems to be a thing right now, especially now after the 2016 election. In a lot of families and for a lot of friends, I think discussion of politics is increasingly off the table. Yes. Right? Yeah. Because the prospect of it is terrifying. <laughs> I think from personal experience, um, like last time I went back home for. Or- thanksgiving so um right after the presidential election my entire family votes republican i was happy that my dad opted out of voting i mean he lives in (laughs) Alabama, so it wouldn't have mattered but um he opted out of voting because he didn't like trump uh Uh and for that i was like well that's half a moral victory um and i tried to avoid it uh, talking about politics because i knew i'd be angry um they, they of course came up but uh was it different you know, this is the you know this is what 
something that's kind of a sticking point for me in these kinds of conversations. How different is it now compared to the past? Um, oh. So, like, you know, the panel shows didn't exist, sure. So maybe that's something that's new. Um, the optics discussions... Oh, you mean uh, the panel shows? Like CNN, mm. MSN, whatever. They're just panel shows. They just yeah. have, you know, stereotypes one, two, three, and four on. <laughs> and they all say their bit about what the current thing. Like, it, it's and not bad sincere. panel shows because they don't invite David Mitchell, <laughs> as also good <laughs> panel shows should. Um, so, like, those didn't exist before, but... One of the things that the media at the moment might be really, really good at, and this is to be a little bit cynical, is making us think that things are worse than they have ever been before. Um, mm -hmm. Why? Well, because drama sells really well, and there yeah. doesn't have to be any other reason than that. Um, and that's a problem for public discourse in its own right, uh, mm -hmm. because we don't, we don't even know what the situation really is that we're engaged in, right? We're all sort of fighting this fiction that may or may not exist. Yeah. And when you have the data that shows that there is widespread agreement across the country uh, between people from left and right leaning groups on issues like healthcare, um, infrastructure, others that we've mentioned, you know, that really clashes with this idea that we're engaged in this particularly partisan moment where nobody agrees on anything and public discourse is destroyed and, politics is so visceral and, and vitriolic now that we can't talk to one another and come to any sort of good, you know, good effective decisions. Yeah. Well, okay. But how do we square that with these polls that show us that people do really agree? So okay. this is really interesting. I think I actually think like, this is tough for me because I actually think both of these things are true. First of all, anecdotally, it does seem worse now, right? It's scary to bring up like, did you vote for Trump or not in ways that you know, that wasn't the case. Maybe I'm right. This is just my own anecdotal experience. But but putting that aside, I think it's 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 possible that it's true that um, it's weird because, yeah, you can have like massive agreement on these sort of central issues and a lot of issues that are important for pro progressives. But I also think at the same time, things are more partisan. And there is some research on this that um, partisanship is stronger than it used to be. There's fewer people that are willing to, you know, cross the aisle. That we're talking about voters and things now. Um, at least last I looked at it, I think that was that was the result. So it's weird. Yeah, because we still like have people to put agree, that back but with they agreement. think that they don't. Just, yeah, they <laughs> think they don't. <laughs> so I was I was just thinking, sort of historically, like, is this really the most partisan time for us? Well, like the civil rights movement, right? That the civil rights era in general seemed like a pretty divided period. We also fought a civil war at one point. Right. Yeah. We, we've. We. That's too we, far back. It doesn't count. Yeah. Brother versus brother, man. <laughs> yeah. I mean, so the civil rights era, we, the uh, civil war era, we've had periods where we were more politically divided than we are now, uh, or at least as politically divided. I mean, when we think about, um, I think people, when they're saying that we're more divided, they have a pretty narrow range. You know, it's like they they think that in the last. 20 years or so we had a period of of more unity i think during the 90s than we probably actually had right and are mostly making the comparison against that political or, moment or what about um even not even going back to the 90s uh 2009 2010 when we were debating about uh you know obamacare for instance that was a very divisive time i mean i i don't have numbers on this is there any reason to think that 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 we're in a worse political situation now um, I mean, admittedly, I think uh, part of uh, the reason to be suspicious of the anecdotal evidence for us being in a worse political position is that the four of us and a lot of the people we talk to run in fairly liberal circles. And so in 2009, 2010, we were on kind of the winning side. Uh, and so things seem good when you're winning. Um, I do wonder, though, and and again, anecdotal, um, it seems like there's a greater tendency now, and perhaps, well, no, I won't say that. There's a greater tendency now to go from, oh, you support this person, or you, or you voted for that person. You're a monster. <laughs> it's not just like, oh, you like yeah. that guy? Uh, it's like, you are off the, like, I can't even talk to you anymore. Forget about it, right? How could you even do that, right? We have, we immediately potentially stereotype and caricature in really strong ways, I, I think, on both sides. And I think in a way that is stronger than it than it used to be. 
I, I think in that respect, for ordinary people, it's more dangerous to bring up these topics than it used to be, sort of for your uh, personal relationships and so on. And I wonder mm -hmm. how much that is, and this is just empirical and would need <laughs> research, yeah. right? How much this is tied to the kinds of media portrayals and the media coverage mm -hmm. of politics that you have right now, where you really mm -hmm. have, you know, the Clinton supporter, the Sanders supporter, da 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 da. You know, I'm thinking back to weapons of mass destruction debates, arguably also a very controversial time. Mm -hmm. I was in another country and we were, you know, engaging in protest marches about it, right? So that was a pretty big moment um, uh, politically, internationally as well. And surely that was a very divisive time, but that wasn't really about the characters or the people who were involved in the game. Um, you know, it was about some issue that people politically disagreed about, um, where the kinds of things that we're sort of raising here, you know, you can't say that you voted for so and so because then you're taken to you'll be taken to be some stereotype of that tribe's particular voter, right? And sort of dismissed out of hand. Um, it's a it's kind of a different sort of generalizing or something that happens, um, or it's happening very often right now. Um, it happens online a lot, very quickly through things like Twitter and. Uh, Facebook and the kind of online shaming culture and stuff makes political engagement and disagreement different, perhaps, than it has been before. But again, I don't know how different. Uh, yeah. So, so I, 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 I want to say I agree with what you've just said, right? So that that all makes sense. But there is part of me wonders if there's also just a change, a shift in our moral sensibilities that, in some ways, have actually become more reasonable, right? And that those kind of responses historically actually would have been appropriate, but were not generally common public attitudes of like, you are a moral monster. Like if you supported Woodrow Wilson, a virulent racist, right? There's a sense in which it was a failure on the part of everybody to not be like, and that kind of makes you morally shitty, right? Um, so in some ways, as our moral sensibilities progress and we become less tolerant of, you know, really virulent shit, we end up having more visceral reactions to people when they support um, politicians who we regard rightfully as morally um, problematic. So I think maybe you guys know, I feel like um, the political correctness rhetoric really started in the mid to late 90s um, and is something that gets policed at an even higher level and is its own entire branch of political discourse now, right? Um, what it is politically correct to say or not to say and who's misbehaving and all of this coverage about people getting it right or getting it wrong and people being too sensitive about it and people not being sensitive enough. And that it feels related to this kind of moralizing behavior that you are um, describing. Um, and there's so much coverage of it now. And it's just a talking point. Everybody knows about political correctness and political correctness gone wrong. Uh, and it's a way to really quickly shut down any conversation. Um, somebody's just being too upset and they're being unreasonable uh, because they're demanding, you know, X, Y, Z, what, what have you. Yeah, it's a really effective rhetorical weapon to pull out, right? And it, in some ways, because it's so effective, it's very uh, hard to resist, I think. At times, uh, which which one of these is the effective rhetorical weapon? The, um, uh, the policing how someone is like policing speech, uh, yeah, in the, or claiming that someone is political using political correctness gone wrong, or like the you know. I think it, I think it works both ways. <laughs> yeah, so yeah. you know, if you were to bring up, um, uh, take something like Chelsea Manning or something, mm -hmm. and you bring up pronoun usage. Yeah. Right. One side of the debate is going to say that's PC gone wrong. Mm -hmm. You shouldn't be monitoring the particular pronouns that people yeah. want to use or you crazy liberal. Rah, 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 you know? Yeah. On the other hand, I think that if you focus on if someone says something like um, and I'm going to clarify, I'm mentioning not using, you know, um, you know, uh, Bradley Manning is a traitor and should be um, put to death. Um and then you say, "Well, actually, it's Chelsea Manning." Well, well, I think it's on. It's important to uh, to like to respect someone's choice, uh, like to like you know to go by the name they want to be uh, to go by. Suddenly, you've changed the debate into something else, yes. <laughs> and what, what you didn't challenge the very cruel, uh, the like the the very very bad idea that um, what Manning did was completely wrong and worthy of death. <laughs> 
Right. Okay. Yeah. So, I, go ahead. Go, go ahead. No, no, you go. Ahead. I was going to transition. I was going to get myself into trouble. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. Okay. <laughs> All right, so, I mean, there is this question as to whether there's any new problem, right? Is political discourse any worse than it has been? It, whether it's a new problem or not, it's problematic, either because it's useless, uh, because people don't have the tools or the interest in actually having uh, useful, productive political conversations, which, by the way, something we haven't mentioned, well, we sort of mentioned earlier, you know, if, you, if, you, if you're thinking about how you want your democracy to be, it would be really valuable if people would actually have these productive discussions, right? It's the thing that arguably is sort of the most, the most important to talk about, right? These policy matters. So, so that sucks, right? It sucks that our debates are either useless or toxic and thus, uh, are pointless or toxic and thus, um, not productive when they are engaged in. And most people don't even want to engage with them mm -hmm. uh, in, in these discussions because it's terrifying and emotionally, Gut wrenching sometimes. Um, so I guess to the extent that it is a problem, I guess there, there is this question: to what extent is the state of our political discourse a problem, and why does it suck? I mean, I think uh, it's very similar to what Michael said early on. It's not just that uh, it sucks because nothing gets done. It's that it seems like the point of the conversations, like in political discourse aren't about reaching solutions to problems. Um, one of those things I think is completely understandable because I think that there's massive disagreement about what the problems are, or at least at, at the level of the rep representatives. I don't know what it's like amongst just uh, right. ordinary folks. Um, but if you disagree about what the problems are, it's going to be very hard to come up with solutions. And so that's, that's one thing. So what's the, why should I enter into po uh, political deliberation with people around me? Um, it sucks because I, I, it's hard for me to motivate that even for myself. Um, I was having a conversation with a class that I was teaching on public disagreement. And this is one of the things that they, uh, that they talked about as a problem with public discourse is the lack of sincerity. So they, one of the reasons that they felt that they felt that it was reasonable for them to not be interested in engaging in political discourse is because the people that they usually see engaged in it, politicians, pundits, um, are not genuinely engaged mm -hmm. in deliberation. They're not sincerely trying to have a conversation that will get to the truth. So, you know, that that's an important problem. Um, if people are sort of seeing that as, oh, like, even the people who are meant to be taking this seriously don't take it seriously. Why should I... You know, what reason is there for me to engage mm -hmm. in it? Um, I think the the new problem, old problem thing is uh, one of the reasons I bring it up is because a lot of the discussion right now is on it being a new problem. And that could be a division in and of itself. Right. So we end up talking a lot about this new problem. We, you know, wax poetic about some nostalgic past in which we all met at the public, you know, forum and came to some, I don't know, Greco Roman, <laughs> you know, toga wearing solutions about every fucking whatever. <laughs> the solutions you know. were wearing togas. <laughs> <laughs> Never happened. Yeah. That possibly you know. might be the most cynical thing I <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Never happened. Right? Mm -hmm. Um so that's weird. Uh but certainly, you know instead of talking about what is toxic, as we're trying to do right now, uh you can just talk about how different things are. <laughs> So I was going to say, I, I do think that there's some evidence that uh, it's not that necessarily people came together in these sort of ideal democratic, um, you know, forums to have discussions. But there is at least some evidence that uh, the nature of political discourse, the level of political discourse has declined to some degree. So like um, the amount of time actually spent when the news is discussing politics, actually discussing substantive policy considerations right, has gone down. The length of political debates themselves for like presidential candidates has gone down. Like the Lincoln, I mean, Lincoln Douglas is like an, the obvious thing I remember from, you know, my political history courses in high school, of like they were hours long and were just two people really going very deep into issues. Those kind of things don't happen now. And it's been replaced by symbolism and imagery and you know, the 
work done in advertising psychology during the 70s became sort of the dominant um, way that political discussions were had in the 80s and 90s, right? And so there's, it does seem like there, there is good evidence that in ways how we have conversations like this have changed. Um, and it might be that there are preconditions figuring out how to um, remove the effects of like manipulative advertising psychology in political discussions might be a precondition for making any progress on political discourse. Mm -hmm. And and part of the problem too is the the political news media has accepted that that's the game, right? That's what we should be focused on is not whether the policy proposals or ideas are are good, but to the ex uh, the extent to which a particular candidate or party has persuaded people, right? And and by whatever means. It would be interesting uh to compare um, you know, the United States context um, around public deliberation and this level of toxicity, the kinds of things that we're picking out as being problematic with other countries um, where it's not like this, right? Obviously, the political systems are different as well, right? So if you take New Zealand, you've got the MMP system, which is going to make it very different anyway, because you're not sort of first past the post two party system. So it's going to demand a very different kind of public deliberation process. We've got more voices in the game, changes a lot of those factors. But, you know, in other countries where, I don't know, take something like Prime Minister's Question Time, uh, which they Classic. have in the UK, yeah. and they also have it in some other Commonwealth countries too. So Prime Minister's Question Time, um, you have the current Prime Minister of the UK, you know, at a podium, and you've got the leader of the opposition opposite, and you've got all of the MPs of the parliament sitting around the house. They've got massive ring binders full of notes on all of these various <laughs> policies, right? And they have it out, and it's broadcast. And they're shorter than they used to be, which is interesting. But, you know, could you do something like that in America, and would that help? Like, is that the kind of thing that... You know, people who are complaining about toxic partisanship and complaining about this kind of political coverage and what that, you know, what the consequences of that are for, you know, your average person's political engagement, the way in which they discuss things. Do we think that that would help? So if you tried to up the bar, tried to force something like Prime Minister's Question Time to happen in America at some level, right, is that is that going to make things better? Does that address any of these issues? So it does seem to me like it might... It who knows if it really does, but it does seem like the issue that you raised earlier, right, that people don't feel like um, their representatives are actually engaging in good faith and are sincere in their efforts. It would at least potentially convince the citizenry that um, it's worth getting involved, right? And we know that uh, a strategy of both, uh, particularly the Republican Party, but to some degree, I imagine both, uh, has been to try to suppress um, participation in the political process and in, you know, voting for their own political interest, you know, to advance their own political interests. So it does seem like maybe it could help in some ways. One um, sort of uh, a separate kind of thing, but uh, an interesting phenomenon, I think, that maybe helps to explain the more citizen to citizen toxicity and strife <laughs> and conflict involved in polit political discussion that I think is interesting and concerning and I, I don't know whether this is new or not, probably not, but it's it's kind of fascinating that sometimes people's positions on complicated policy matters um, that are highly partisan, like, again, uh, tax reform or health care, right? There's this sort of generally Democrat Democratic position and a Republican position. People feel so strongly about these things that they almost become sort of features of their identity, right? Whether you are a Republican or a Democrat becomes a feature of of their identity, which is a, a strange kind of thing to me. Um, and again, typically when we're thinking about identity, we're talking about like, you know, deep facts about you that make you who you are, your cultural heritage, mm -hmm. uh, you know, your gender or race might be these things, for instance. Um, you wouldn't think your political affiliation would belong in there. And in particular, you wouldn't think that, you know, uh, a, a belief about macroeconomics, for instance, whether free markets are the solution, just to take one example. Um, would belong in there. And, and to the extent that those do become wrapped up in people's identities, what does that mean? Well, if you take something to be sort of central to your identity, identity like your cultural heritage or something, first of all, it's not, on, it's, it's not open to discussion, 
right? It's not on the table. You, you can't be criticized about it. This is just who I am, right? Number one. So that already kind of makes productive discussion basically impossible. It's just not the sort of thing that you're meant to discuss, right? You respect that this is who I am and that's the end of it. The other thing it means is that be, as a consequence of that, um, people don't feel inclined to learn more about those things, right? Because if something is just sort of part of your identity, that's the end of the story. It's just done. That's who I am. It's not like I'm supposed to go out and figure out about the economic consequences of some really complicated policy. That's just it. Mm. And so I, I don't know. I think, again, I don't know that this is new, but I, I see that as a phenomenon. And I think that kind of contributes to both the toxicity and the pointlessness <laughs> of, of the political discussions. Um, no, I think I think that's right, especially when you're saying the idea that um, incorporating like fairly detailed economic policies into what we take to be sort of identity constituting um, or to avoid stupid philosophers speak into the sort of things that are off the table for discussion with other people <laughs> that you can just hold on with conviction um, is particularly strange because you would think those are precisely the sorts of policies that should be based on evidence and are really uh, difficult to know about right they're really com that's the fascinating thing they're really complicated problems that it's not clear anyone has appropriate evidence to be confident about these things yet and and yet and, and it's weird um because for all their sort of misinformation <laughs> uh americans are willing to be sort of really confident about these positions Despite we're their lack of evidence. We're, we're generally a low-confidence, high-confidence people. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> well, I think that, I mean, that's part of this um, trust dynamic that you have, right? Um, so you take your representatives to be people who have done that kind of work, who are informed, and you, you know, form your political identity just through this trusting network to these people who are meant to be the experts who are informed. You know, we do this with climate change, we do it with lots of other kinds of beliefs, right? I personally can't understand the body of literature that supports the fact that anthropogenic climate change is happening, but I believe that it is. Um, why? Well, because I trust the experts <laughs> um, on this matter. I don't think that belief is sort of keyed up into my identity in this way that makes it off the table for discussion, right? But I, I expect it's probably similar. Why it goes that extra step, um, why we allow people to make these really controversial political uh, topics part of their identity such that they can't be deliberated on, if we do do that, um, that's bizarre. Because mm -hmm. take something like religious beliefs. Um, people's religious beliefs obviously are going to have really uh, strong consequences for their political beliefs, but we won't let them use their religious justifications in public political decision-making, or at least we try not to, and it's meant to be an ideal that they don't, right? If you want to justify anti-abortion policy, it is best if you do so in secular terms, right? This is a common thought. It's a mm. Large, Largely ignored during the Bush years. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, that's, that's kind of the thought, right? This is why religions aren't taught in public schools. Um, it's a different kind of reason giving. Nonetheless, it's not that you can't argue for the conclusion that you want, it's just the reasons that you have to use different ones. Why? Well, because part of the problem with religious beliefs is that they have exactly this kind of character, right? The fact that you just have... Uh, faith and conviction that is unquestionable is a good thing about those sorts of beliefs. Um, and you get the same kind of feature now with some of these political identity uh, beliefs that make them unchallengeable convictions, uh, which is strange for beliefs that are empirical or scientific in basis, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, you have beliefs about macroeconomic policy can be researched. <laughs> Beliefs about um, the sanctity of souls are not the kinds of things that the scientific or empirical yeah, methods yeah. are good for finding out about, right? It's just a different kind of thing. So it does, I mean, I, I agree with you that in sort of intellectual terms or epistemic terms, it's hard to understand. But on the other hand, it's not, it is to some degree understandable how it is that people tie um, their beliefs about macroeconomic issues uh, to their own sort of personal identities, right? So for, take, for example, the belief that free markets function in a way that's fair. Well, a lot of people who believe that are people who have been very successful working within 
free markets, right? And a big part of their personal mm -hmm. identity is built on the idea that the successes they've had are ones that they've earned, right? And their personal ego is at least in part based on that. So it it's not really that um, hard to understand why they would be protective. They'd want to be protective of that idea that free markets function fairly, even though that, you know, questions of actual fairness and social mobility, those are all questions that are fundamentally empirical questions, right? That are up to economists and sociologists to answer and not um, people based on their own personal anecdotes. But when it comes to one's sense of self-worth, it's very hard to resist that kind of anecdotal, the kind of anecdotal reasoning that typically goes hand in hand with the belief that free markets function fairly. Yeah. The more difficult case is obviously the not very well-to-do conservatives that will have those positions with the same strength. I mean, it's not hard to give an explanation. Um, frankly, the propaganda has been effective. End of the story. Yeah. But the, the other thing, too, that um, is interesting about what the political parties have done, I don't know whether it's knowingly, intentionally or not. Um, but so while some sort of empirical political questions have become parts of people's identity, and that's a problem, at the same time, cultural facts, uh, cultural features about people have become political. And everyone's aware of this, right? Everyone's going to associate, you know, NASCAR or baseball, maybe. <laughs> I actually don't know about baseball. Lattes. I think, uh, I, think, I, think, right. I think baseball might be fairly apolitical. <laughs> really? But, uh, I don't but, know. But, Anyways, um, you know, if you, are, if you identify as a redneck, you probably identify yourself as being politically conservative. If you, you know, live in a city and, as Hannah said, drink lattes, you're, you probably identify as being a liberal. Now, of course, mm -hmm. these facts about you are, you know, they're culturally significant. Or like hunting and fishing is another good case. I should have yeah. said that. And you're likely to be conservative. Um, these are real cultural distinctions, but it's very hard to draw the connection between those and the kinds of policy issues that are associated with being conservative or, or liberal. Some of them, you can make those connections. Um, but, you know, if you're ta talking about like campaign finance or, or tax reform or healthcare, good luck. Uh, no one's made those connections clear. And yet people, they, b because the cultural has become partisan, that often is enough for them to just say like, okay, this is, this is my ideology. This is my sort of incoherent collection of policy ideas that I now have. <laughs> It, um, uh, that distinction, I think, um, is one of those things that makes partisanship seem so much worse. Because if you're looking at, say, the cultural shifts that have taken place over the past two decades, for instance, um, those have been largely in a liberal, progressive-leaning uh, fashion, right? Um, gay marriage, uh, other things mm -hmm. like that, right? These are progressive kinds of cultural ideas that have become more mainstream and have displaced uh, a lot more of the traditional conservative ideas. And then you've got, on the other hand, things like economic policy, um, where economically neoliberalism, right, um, and free markets and this sort of associated ideology is much more on the right side of the political spectrum. Yeah, general deregulation and general so deregulation, on all of that kind right of stuff. Policies. Yeah, um, has been more right wing. If we're really focused on the cultural things, right? If you're a conservative who's really concerned about those cultural things, you're going to have this perception that things have gotten, you know, the, the political landscape has changed massively, right? And has changed massively in favor of the other team. If you're really concerned with the, uh, you know, economic policy type stuff, right? Then you're going to have completely the opposite position. But either way, right? If one group is focusing on the cultural changes and the other group is focusing on just economic changes, they're going to think that the sort of landscape is incredibly divided um, and unfair uh, and that their identity is massively under attack. This causes real crisis for some individuals. So uh, I know someone who came to me once and said, uh, look, I, essentially they expressed this kind of political confusion that they were having for themselves because they did all of these kinds of Republican activities. They did hunting and fishing and NASCAR and all of those kinds of Republican type stuff. But when they were watching the debates happen, they found themselves agreeing with a lot of the democratic policy decisions, right? 
on a whole range of issues. In fact, they found themselves agreeing more with the Democrats on political issues than they did the Republicans. And they expressed this as a kind of, you know, deep crisis within themselves. They didn't know whether or not they were Republican or not. They were asking me, am I a Republican? Right. Because they had this disconnect between this cultural stuff that they were doing and engaged in that their family was doing and was engaged in and the policy positions they found themselves agreeing with. See, that's just such a massive win for the political parties, right? If someone's going to be like, well, I do Republican things. I guess I'm a Republican. That's amazing. (laughs) Yeah. That whole conversation about justification legitimacy, totally irrelevant. (laughs) Right. If it all, if, if, you know, partisanship is determined on the basis of your hobbies, uh, we're, I, I, we're, to- we're throwing through, you know, talking to the wind. <laughs> I, I do. I, I, I certainly think you're, I, I don't disagree at all about just the general association of hobbies to people's political positions. I do worry at times that people like us, um, are unfair to, um, Republican voters in that we, we, overly marginalize the importance of the cultural value stuff that is, you know, in the forefront of their political concerns. Um, and that we often sort of make it seem like it's completely irrational for them to prefer Republican representatives to Democratic representatives when, at, at the very least, professional Uh, elite Democratic representatives are typically very ineffective at talking to Republican voters, um, those kinds of Republican voters, and are frankly smug and condescending Mm -hmm. in the way that we talk to them. And it's it's one of the things that we, you know, that progressives, I think, have to get better at if uh, they're going to convince Republican voters that um, they aren't as sort of a in opposition to each other as, as Republican voters think. Um, and often I think it's, it's also that there, there end up being nuances in terms of like white working class voters interests and the interests of the working poor or those who are, you know, in facing serious material deprivation. And I think professional elites are often, this is a point made in the book, uh, the white working class. I think, uh, professional elites, are generally very sympathetic to the very poor, right, and are ready to promote policies that are going to be sort of um, uplifting to the very poor, but are ultimately not going to reach high enough up the economic ladder to help the white working class voters who probably work, you know, often work two or three jobs and uh, make major sacrifices in order to build the kind of uh, comfortable life for the family that that is of utmost importance to them. Um, and so in some ways, I think it's actually, I think it's, it is an area where we can do a disservice to progressive goals if we talk to or talk about sort of white working class um, and Republican voters, the ones that, you know, the NASCAR voter, if we don't recognize that there are some substantial problems on the left and how we end up representing them and talking to them. So that's interesting. I would have thought, or from my perspective at least, the stereotyping stuff is bad on both sides. Um, but I think that the example that you pick is particularly interesting because on the left, uh, the ability to have conversations about class in terms of identity has moved a lot, right? So we tend instead to focus a lot more, or a lot of people on the left tend to focus a lot more on issues of race and gender. Um, and those kinds of identity marginalized groups, um, rather than class groups. You know, it, just take the last political campaigns, right? Bernie Sanders trying to talk about class groups was just, te- you know, terrible for him in terms of, uh, the left responding positively to that. People who are centrist Democrats, right? They took that to be, um, undermining all of this hard work that's been done to try to culturally make it acceptable to talk about gender and race and to take those as being politically salient features. So I, I, I kind of feel, I think, I think you're right that the left is really bad at, uh, can be really bad at stereotyping the other side and in particular ways that completely disregard a lot of these, you know, material disadvantages um, that people in the working classes experience. It kind of, I don't know, it kind of seems like shit slinging on both sides that we're all kind of bad at. Um, But it's interesting the different way that it happens and what topics are acceptable cultural identity things for the left 
to talk about, uh, you know, versus the right. Um, One of the nice things about being a progressive, I guess, is that we can be critical and condescending to both Democrats and Republicans. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Not condescending. Sorry, that (laughs) slipped. (laughs) <laughs> um, yeah, I think the, my, my biggest pitch for being a progressive to my Republican family is that I, too, dislike Democrats, yeah. um, but I like them for better reasons. Honestly, there, were, there are fewer pitches that sell as well as that one. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe we should stop. It really real plays well with that crowd. <laughs> we, should, yeah. we should end on this. <laughs> Thanks for listening to this episode of the Badlands Politics and Philosophy Podcast. If you're enjoying the podcast, you can help it grow by subscribing and by giving it a good rating or a review. And don't forget to check out our website, badlandsphilosophy.com, where you can find a list of citations for every episode and access written content that we post there regularly. This week, you can check out the piece that I wrote that served as the basis for this conversation, which again is called The Cure for Toxic Partisanship is Not Coming Together, and we'll also have a piece from Jared up which is titled The Case for Free Banking Services. So as always, if you're interested, you should check those out on our website, badlandsphilosophy.com. If you want to get in touch with us, you can do that through our website, and you can also find us on Twitter at at the Badlands Pod. Thanks again for listening. Thanks again for listening.